Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, including those who cannot be with us today, to say that rock art is in danger is not an understatement. Weathering processes and destruction by humans have already greatly reduced the amount of information available. The condition of the art is continuing to deteriorate. Therefore, we must redouble our efforts to document it if we are to give our past a future. As rock art researchers, we are fortunate to live in exciting times. Advances in science and technology present a range of possibilities. We can handle larger and larger amounts of data, allowing us to make our samples more statistically representative. New methodologies and approaches are allowing us to more systematically consider, analyze, and interrogate, and visualize new variables. However, as the application of the new technologies and their associated methodologies becomes more widespread, we need to remain critically aware. All of a sudden, it seems all archaeologists can document rock art. The specialisms possessed by a few are rendered redundant by the new technology available to the many. True, one can learn the essentials of a good surface-based documentation over a relatively short period of time. But this is not mutually exclusive to the digital methods, as the annual working seminar at Unterschluss Museum demonstrates. It is very positive for the future of the discipline that more take an interest in it. However, to obtain the best results from the technology still requires skill, arguably even more than before. To address all these heterogeneous elements and their articulations requires everything from an artistic eye to computer science and everything in between. Even though we are faced with as yet unknown possibilities, there are and will always be limits to how far one can push, push one's interpretation. These appear to be poorly understood by many, including experienced researchers. There are a number of false friends out there that can lead to some unlucky conclusions, to quote amateur archaeologist and finder of rock art, Martin Stolzer. The perceived specialisms of the rock art researcher's craft are seen as a black art by many outside the field. Although efforts are being made at Göteborg and Aarhus, the skills required are not widely taught at university level. Therefore, the methods appear sinister to many. For archaeologists, as scientists, sinister is often read as being subjective or having dubious concrete foundations. As my colleague Ellen Meyer and I recently wrote, for many, the model has become the reality, and research is moving to moving the focus of study further and further away from the rock. This leads to a loss of what has been termed by Gerhard Mirstreit as the dialogue with the surface. This proposition is taken up and examined in greater depth in the research of colleague Dieter Kufford. In particular, Kufford has highlighted the importance of fingertip inspection, an essential skill mastered only with experience but often overlooked. She writes, quote, some people, although with the best intentions, argued that the tactile methods are becoming unnecessary with the development in the digital te techniques. The author entirely agrees with Crawford that this position should be seen as preposterous. Equally preposterous is the notion that many colleagues claim they can see or illustrate things in the model that cannot be seen by the naked eye. This I believe to be fundamentally false. The resolution offered by the available technology is not yet sufficient to support such conclusions. Furthermore, there appears to be a fundamental misunderstanding concerning what compromises ob objectivity, particularly the difference between mechanical and true objectivity. There also seems to be a lack of awareness of the operation of the methods, that is to say, how the result on the screen is, is derived. Objectivity is one of the key themes in these arguments, how we define it, how and if we are trying to understand it, or if we are simply playing the ostrich. Increased or total objectivity is often used as a justification for the merits of new technology. However, few actually discuss what objectivity is, and no one, in rock art, is discussing what it actually means in the context of the new technologies and methodologies we are applying. We draw conclusions from the study of the surface of the model, often without reference to the original, without understanding how that result has been obtained. We often fail to take enough control of settings or show awareness of the limitations of the technology. Looking at the texts of several recently published articles and from discussion with my colleagues, it has become apparent that this discipline has, has, has failed to understand the meaning of objectivity in the context of digital technologies. So what is objectivity? There is more than one definition, depending on the context, and we need to remain mindful of which context we refer to. Structure from motion, structured light and laser scanning, are mechanically objective. A computer is a deterministic machine. It cannot produce a truly random sequence. 
Given a set of input data, it will produce accurate, that is, repeatable, results. However, given a different set of input parameters, a different result will be produced. This is more so for SFM than with scanning, where low light, distance from the object, and overlap between images introduce variation more regularly. The question is whether these differences are significant enough to influence the answers to the questions we are posing. What archaeologists tend to think of when they refer to objectivity in the context of documentation of rock art is something that is independent, unbiased, and a true representation of reality, devoid of any interpretation or operator influence. Despite the shifts in developments in technology, it seems that we are often not really dealing with the discussion of digital over analog, or more versus less objective, but of surface-based versus figure-based methods the possibilities and limitations offered by existing and emerging techniques, and how we interpret the copies we have created, complete with their imperfections. The merits of surface-based documentation over an interpretive one is not a new one, although it is still being discussed in the literature. The world's first large-scale surface-based documentation project was began, begun 40 years ago, following the decision taken in the late 1980s by Gerhard Mistroy, Director of Tyler Museum of Rock Art and Research Centre Underskurs Sweden, and Ulf Bertelsen, head of the Swedish Nat Heritage Board at that time, to move the fieldwork of Tarnum's Holocene Museum Underskurs away from a figure based documentation to a surface based one. Let us now move on to consider operation. You will note that I mentioned structured light and laser scanning separately. Many users mistakenly believe that the leading product on the market, Creoform's HandyScan 700TM, is a laser scanner and therefore independent of the photogrammetric system. The texture is built using on-the-fly photogrammetry by two stereoscopically mounted calibrated precision optics operating under the range-finding principles that measure the deformation of the lasers projected onto the surface with reference to the reference values contained during calibration. On the fly, image recognition extracts the target points and segments these to create the coordinate system for the model. The precision optics may be affected by pressure, temperature, and humidity. The scanner is neither ac as accurate or precise as we seem to believe. The figure often cited is an accuracy of 0.06 millimeters at the point of initialization. The latter part of that sentence is not cited by those using the technology, despite the Scandinavian agents emphasizing it. Unpublished tests which witnessed by the author show that when a circle measuring more than 1.5 meters in circumference is scanned, up to 5 millimeter of, of error appears, and the measure does not meet in the same plane. Therefore, we can conclude that the greater the distance from the initialization of the scan, the less precise the model. There is also an issue with errors in the writing of the surface. Noise appears in the models at times. This is probably due to the precision of the machine, reflections from components of the rock, and the challenge that the system has when working with translucent materials, like plants, in our case, lichen and bacterial growth. Lens distortion is not unexpectedly a problem in SFM. When scaling the models, the position of a point varies widely due to the distortion of the lens. Light levels affect this, leading to higher residual values, residuals referring to the spread of values for the distribution of the points in the model in turn leading to precision. I stated in my abstract that models can be manipulated, but, whoop, but, but so can other established forms of documentation. Manipulation occurs on two levels, intentional and unintentional, and some transformations are more harmful than others. When it comes to the models, I find it more useful to think and refer to them as visualizations. It is also cr critical that people make their models available and that the transformations applied are made clear as part of scientific transparency. The models are loaded with interpretation in the choice of settings, the area and amount of data included in the documentation. I note that many use the, in the interpolated and extra extrapolated functions. On the one hand, in a well-meaning sense, to increase the number of features included in the point cloud and mesh. However, the very nature that they are, they are probability-based results, as Aggie Soft themselves state, in neither accurate or, re or precise reconstruction. One might argue, so what? However, the question of how accurate the reconstruction is becomes paramount 
when assertions are made that we can see things in the model that cannot be seen with the human eye. This all boils down to a case of resolution, and if that resolution is adequate to enough to answer the questions we pose. SFM is subject to variation, while structured light and laser scanning is consistent. In SFM, position errors are most evident during the scaling of the model and require manual correction. Aggies often more open than Crayform about the workings of their technology. The need for commercial secrecy of the software providers is understandable, but problematic for ascertaining the quality of what we are producing. This is detrimental from a scientific perspective, as academic convention now requires reproducible open science. I am of the opinion that there is no information that cannot be detected on the surface itself. As Maya often says, the surface contains more information than we have yet recognised. And this is why we need to document as many whole surfaces with the best means available to us. In this quest, there is no room for petty squabbling, politics or personal self-interest. Surface-based models and evaluation, surface-based methods and evaluation of our data in consultation with the surface force us to look at the material with new eyes and new methods give us new visualizations. If we are to believe we can see things in the model that we cannot detect with the human eye, it is generally accepted that the minimum size of an object that can be resolved by the human eye is 0.2 millimeters, around the width of a human hair. Therefore, if we are to make this claim, the method we are using must be able to show an object at least the width of a human hair, and moreover, its structure. SFM and structured light scanning do not resolve objects the width of a human hair. I hate to break it to you, but in frottage, if a hair comes between the paper and the surface, it shows in the rubbing. What we want, what we want when we create our copies is a 1-1 one -one reproduction. The copies we, are, we have made are a great achievement and very useful, but they do not show as much as we sometimes think they do. Look at the information about the copy you have made and make your conclusions accordingly, according to the circumstances. We also need to be mindful that we're using technology that has not been designed with our needs in mind. The scanner is developed for use in reverse engineering. Different deviance from defined tolerances is most important. According to Creaform themselves, prediction of the surface is used to speed up and streamline mod modeling of smooth planar surfaces. This predicted surface is only replaced if the margins of tolerance, defined by Creaform, and therefore unknown, are exceeded by the actual value. On the other hand, when we use the orthophoto function in Photoscan, we're using the technology as intended. The alignment matching a mosaic in multiple aerial photos. The only difference is our images are not from a spy satellite. Let us now consider interpretation. As my colleague Ellen, I, Ellen Meyer and I recently wrote, the model has become the reality. We study our computers and not the original rock surface. Yet the best model, the best representation of reality is not the model people fool themselves into creating they have thinking they have captured, but the original surface. So when the sun is shining, when the lamp is illuminated at night, there is no need for a model. The best model is the rock itself. All the resolution we strive for is there. It is the only true source of information. Again, as Crawford observes, nothing can replace study of the surface on site. To this I add, nothing can replace the surface once it is weathered away, as construction will be in relation to limited understanding of a known geological distribution. Three paragraphs. Joachim Goldhahn and Jan Norbla have both separately stated that a perfect documentation, taking into account all the aspects that should be taken into account, does not exist. For this reason, in my abstract, I call it a utopian elixir. We need again, as Crawford, Meyer, Milstor, and myself have repeatedly stated, to use as many possible tools as we can from those at our disposal. For example, my own work in the field can call on artificial light, frottage, fingertip inspection, favorable sun sunlight, and image-based modeling. Models are processed in the field using cluster processing running on a supercomputer, and it's often possible to pull down the process model for study whilst on site. In the future, there remains an absolute and definite need for the specialist skills of the rock art specialist. We are still in dialogue with the surface only now with even more powerful tools at our fingertips. Thank you. <laughs>